Uh, thanks for uh, coming to the session. I'm uh, presenting today with uh, Martin Klein and uh, Michael Nelson. And this is actually the first presentation that we're doing about uh, a Mellon project that we're involved in that we've started to refer to as uh, the scholarly uh, orphan uh, project. And the <coughs> this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, I'll start with the problem statement and the project perspective. And then uh, Michael and uh, Martin will look into aspects of, um, well, explorations that we're currently doing in search of a solution of the problem. And I'll start with uh, the problem uh, statement itself. The, co the context of the project is the uh, rapidly changing uh, nature of uh, scholarship online, uh, with the consideration being that increasingly uh, the research process and not only the outcomes of research uh, are online. So we see researchers basically dropping artifacts uh, all around the web in various kind of productivity uh, portals, uh, you could say. So extension of the scholarly record with a wide variety of new uh, artifacts. And interesting in all of this is that these artifacts are in many times actually dropped in portals that are not necessarily dedicated to scholarship. Now I'm talking things like GitHub or SlideShare and so on. So they're a bit all over the place. Some of these portals are for scholarship specifically, but others are more you know, general uh, and are also used by scholars. I'd like to mention that uh, people in the Netherlands actually have started to create a registry of these kind of tools. It goes under the name of uh, 100 Innovations in Scholarly Communication. And so they basically list all these new kind of portals that researchers are using uh, as they go about uh, their business. And they categorize them like in writing, analysis, discovery assessment, outreach, uh, etc. A couple CNIs ago, uh, we had a presentation from OCLC on this notion of the evolving scholarly record also. So this is also part of the context that we're looking at. And here, um, basically, OCLC was considering, well, what is really the scholarly record? You know, where, where how you delineate it? And they came also from the perspective of archiving this new scholarly record and whose task is it actually to archive all those new uh, types of materials. I've myself done quite some thinking in that real over the past uh, years also. And for example, I uh, did a paper uh, for iPress with Andrew Trelor. He's at the Australian uh, National Data Service. Uh, again, where we consider uh, this fact that uh, a lot of common web platforms are used for scholarship, like GitHub and Wikis and WordPress. And there's reasons that researchers are using this, because these portals have attractive features, uh, like versioning, timestamping, social embedding, and so on. But then we basically say in this paper, but be careful, these platforms are actually recording scholarship, they are not archiving it. And in order to illustrate that, it suffices actually to look at the terms, or part of the terms of GitHub. And, you know, I read with you, GitHub reserves the right at any time and from time to time to modify, discontinue temporarily or permanently the service or part of the without any prior notice. This is not an archival service, that's obvious, right? To make another point, <coughs> you probably all remember Google Code, which at one point was really the repository for software collaboration. Well, since 2015, it's gone. Everyone uses GitHub now, and what will be next? The point is, longevity is not necessarily part of the business model of these uh, kind of portals. So Andrew and I have kind of categorized what we see as the difference between, on the one hand, recording that is being done in these productivity portals and archiving. And, you know, short term, no guarantees provided for the long term write many, read many, and it's about the scholarly process. Where, on the other hand, archiving for the scholarly record is obviously longer term. There are attempts, at least, to provide guarantees of longevity. It's write once, read many, and this is, once you've archived it, it actually becomes part of the scholarly record. Okay. Throughout the presentation, 
uh, Martin and Michael will actually use these two uh, colleagues of ours as examples of people that are actually using these productivity portals uh, online. One is Ian Milligan, historian, but uses a lot of web archiving technology from the University of uh, Waterloo, and uh, Mark Marchenzo from uh, Stanford University. And when you look up these people, then you see indeed that they have various web identities, we call them. So there's a home page, uses SlideShare, uses GitHub. And obviously, they leave scholarly traces in all these environments. And Mark also has a home page, also SlideShare, also GitHub, uh, also uses the Open Science Framework, and actually contributes code uh, to the Drupal uh, repository also. So again, those are all traces uh, that they're leaving around the web. The problem, as I mentioned, is that these platforms are recording and not archiving. And of course, we have web archiving uh, activities going on. But, and this is of course only anecdotal evidence, we look here at one of uh, Ian's uh, slide share uh, artifacts, and we use the time travel service that looks across all public web archives. And it's basically, this thing is archived nowhere. It's in no web archive uh, around the world. <coughs> the situation is a little bit better for this uh, GitHub repository uh, of Ian, where we actually find exactly one copy of this repository in the Internet Archive. For those of you that are familiar uh, with the Internet Archive, the typical pattern is that you have a lot of bars here, meaning stuff is archived a lot. As I said, this is anecdotal. Out of the Hyperlink project, we actually know that what we call web at large resources are generally speaking very poorly web archived. Okay. So that's really the problem that is at the basis of uh, this project. It's a Mellon funded project, Scholarly Orphans, collaboration between uh, Los Alamos and Old Dominion University. And the problem that we're really looking at is how could we capture these artifacts that are, that are left in all these different portals so that they could be archived, uh, preserved? And we take a paradigm that's inspired by uh, web archiving, one because of the scale of the problem, uh, also because striking bilateral agreements with each of these portals in order to allow back office archiving is probably not realistic. And then we also explore a paradigm that's institution driven <coughs> in the sense that we consider it the task of the institution to look after its own researchers and to figure out where on the web they are and where they leave traces and then go after them. That doesn't necessarily mean that these institutions have to do that themselves, but a subscription service or so could do it on behalf of uh, institutions. So this is a very high level picture of how we're looking at the problem domain. There's an institution with several researchers and these researchers have identities in these productivity portals uh, on the web. And in each of these portals, they are creating artifacts, they are leaving their traces. And so basically from the perspective of our project, uh, these become candidates to go capture in order to then uh, be able to archive them. You will undoubtedly recognize similarities with some other projects uh, out there. Clearly, Logs, which also takes a web archival, web crawling kind of approach, but focuses on journal literature. We explicitly are not looking at that material because other people are looking into that. Archive.it, which is the on-demand service of the Internet Archive, again, because subscription-based grabbing of materials but clearly not focused on the scholarly orphans that we are after. To an extent, institutional repository, right? But with that difference that in institutional repositories, scholars are actually supposed to upload their stuff. That's not what we're about. We're about automatically trying to grab it. And of course, again, institutional repositories focus on the journal literature, not necessarily on these materials that we're discussing. The closest similarity is maybe this thing I came across called the, the Locker Project. It's, Emil, it doesn't exist anymore, actually. It was uh, active about five, six years ago. This was a project to capture the web presence <coughs> of individuals, 
by basically uh, interacting, scraping, etc., from different portals around the web. It didn't have a scholarly focus, it was more about convenience. You leave your pictures in Flickr and your slides there, etc., and let's now bring them all into one environment under control of the user. That was the Locker project. So, <coughs> this is the flow that we are currently exploring to try and look into this problem. And uh, again, Martin and Michael will go into details, so I'll only explain at the very high level. There's four steps in the chain that we are considering currently. First is discovering these web identities of our scholars. So from an institutional perspective, how do you figure out what all these identities are of your people in these portals out there? Second step, once you have discovered these identities, go find the artifacts that they attach to those identities. Typically, when you have these things that you put in those portals, it's not just one URI, because many of these things have landing pages, and underneath, there are other resources that relate to the object. So there's this notion of, what is once you found an artifact, what is the boundary? How many URLs do you really need to capture in order to get the essence of the entire artifact? Okay. And then the last one is, of course, to actually go and capture the materials for each of these URIs that sit under a certain artifact. And with that, I'm going to leave it uh, to Mark. Thank you, Herbert. So I'll start by looking into step one of our, our uh, capture flow. And uh, does this work? Nope. Uh, there in particular, we're um, exploring two approaches. We explored one, the algorithmic approach in the past, and now we're focusing on the uh, exploration of a web identity uh, um, a registry. So the pointer to previous work, uh, the uh, uh, algorithmic approach of identifying web identities was um, uh, published in, in code for lib We called the system an uh, uh, ego system that basically used a list of postdoc scholars from Los Alamos National Labs and some uh, additional information, for example, their institution that they graduated from, and use that information to feed into APIs, like search engine APIs, LinkedIn, those sort of things, to discover where would they, uh, what would their uh, web identities be, and uh, build a, a nice uh, graph around it, and so on and so forth. I, I highly recommend um, the, the code for the paper where we uh, um, detailed the implementation of uh, the entire system. All right. So, uh, our current approach <coughs> focuses on uh, uh, registries, uh, and the first registry that may come to mind for trying to identify uh, web identities is ORCID. Uh, again, we take our uh, two um, um, sample researchers here, Ian and Mark, both of them have an ORCID profile, uh, and uh, if you look at, for example, Ian's uh, ORCID profile, this might be hard to read in the back, you'll see um, uh, a couple of information points about his, uh, his education, uh, his employment history, some funding information, and some works, mostly uh, published uh, papers. But we'll see zero web identities. You will notice on the left-hand side where they would usually occur, as you'll see in a second, it's blank, it's white, right? So no further references to identities of uh, Ian in other scholarly portals. If you look at Mark's ORCID uh, um, um, page, on the other hand, we see similar information about education, employment, and so on and so forth. But on the left-hand side, you'll notice we see three web identities that uh, Mark left in his ORCID profile. One being a reference to his professional web page, so it's her, uh, his own uh, web presence, and uh, uh, two references to Scopus and to the researcher ID, uh, where you could potentially find further publications uh, by Mark. So if we now take the uh, reference to his personal web page and follow that reference, we'll land, of course, uh, on his site, and there, by browsing a little bit around, we'll um, be able to discover to further your eyes to uh, web identities of Mark, namely his uh, Twitter account and in, uh, the reference to his GitHub account. So uh, a very manual approach in this context is to make the point that uh, uh, web identities could potentially be discovered in this way. So um, <coughs> I'll, I'll be briefly um, uh, talking about an experiment that we conducted in the past and um, uh, uh, I've written down in a paper that will be published later this year at JCDL and a preprint is available, uh, where we really uh, evaluate uh, ORCID records for the sake of discovering web identities. Um, 
the question that immediately comes to mind, well, how well do, do ORCID records represent the, the community of researchers at large? And we approach this question by th uh, from three different angles. We're looking at the adoption rate of ORCID records, we're looking at the subject coverage of ORCID records, as well as the geolocation uh, coverage of ORCID records. And then, last but not least, we're trying to answer the question now, how uh, well do, do ORCID, rec ORCID records actually do for the discovery of uh, uh, these, these web identities? So it's not a secret that ORCID has, uh, has seen an increasing uptake for, for researchers. The uh, bars on the, uh, the, on the far left, the, in dark blue, over, over time, from the four uh, ORCID data dumps that we get, uh, are uh, uh, increasing, right? So we're now at, uh, uh, in 2016, we're at two and a half million ORCID records. You probably have seen that they just passed 3.1 million records and so on and so forth. So that's a nice little trend. Uh, you'll see in dark red the fraction of ORCID records that actually have works information, so your publications, for example. L uh, the lighter red shade is uh, mm -hmm. representing the a fraction of ORCIDs that have affiliation information attached to it, and the, uh, in orange, uh, the, uh, the number of ORCID records that actually hold web identities, such as the uh, URI right to the web page, the personal web page of Mark, as we've seen a couple of sites ago. You'll see that the fraction is. Uh, on, on, a, on a shallow view, not great, right? So in 2016, we have 26% uh, of ORCID records that actually hold affiliation information, 20% will hold works, publication information, and uh, just above 6% only hold information about further web identities. So um, I mentioned that we're uh, uh, addressing the coverage notion from the three different angles. First angle is the subject coverage. So how well do ORCID records and the information left in ORCID records uh, represent the scholarly um, um, uh, uh, landscape at large? Uh, for details of this graph, I refer to the paper. However, you'll see uh, ORCID records in blue and uh, overall publications in the US held in red. And the first thing that comes to, uh, to mind here, observing this graph, is that the subjects are, co are dominated by life sciences. Right. That may or may not be surprising to you, but uh, um, uh, subjects such as the humanities are almost not covered at all in ORCID profiles. The other aspect that, comes, uh, um, that you can observe uh, from this graph is if you compare the ORCID records, uh, the subject of ORCID records, with the uh, subject of PhD res researchers that have graduated recently in the US, you'll see, uh, for example, in, uh, for the field of engineering, there are many more uh, PhD graduates in that field than there are uh, 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 publications left in ORCID records. Right? So that seemed to be a notion of underrepresentation for ORCIDs there. So the point here is uh, the subject coverage seems to be okay, but it's fairly focused towards the life sciences and other subjects maybe under underrepresented. All right, how about the uh, geolocation coverage? These are the top 10 uh, affiliation from ORCID uh, records, the most recent affiliation from ORCID records. And uh, two things are important there to note. Uh, compared with the, in the la in the, uh, on the right-hand side with the, um, um, the fraction of researchers worldwide, the distribution of re researchers worldwide as reported by UNESCO. So two things important there. First is the fraction of US ORCID records, if you will, compared to uh, the fraction of US-based researchers is, is, is pretty good, right? <laughs> Roughly 17% on both cases for ORCID and the real world. The other thing that uh, is obvious here <laughs> that uh, ORCID, uh, researchers with ORCID IDs from China, from the Chinese institutions, seem to be underrepresented in ORCID if you compare that to the almost 20% uh, worldwide. And that holds true for Japan and for Russia and for Germany and so on and so forth. So there's a little bit of a, uh, 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 not, not quite a balance. Right, so in terms of web identities, um, the references to home pages, for example, what do we find there in all our ORCID records that we looked at? Um, the problem here, as you'll notice, is this is uh, these labels for uh, uh, references to other web identities are free text. So you, you as an ORCID uh, uh, researcher, you can type in whatever you'd like to label that URI, which then automatically results in you know, LinkedIn and uh, LinkedIn profile as two different categories where actually it should be the same, right? However, the point is, uh, with very uh, uh, low percentages, things like references to LinkedIn, ResearchGate, Academia EDU, Google Scholar, and personal web pages seem to be the dominating fraction of web identities that we find in ORCID records. All right, uh, 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 a brief summary in between of all these findings. The adoption rate of ORCIDs, as you've seen in the bar graph, is increasing, which is a good sign. So that's a, that's a good direction that we're going in, and we're happy about that. 
the subject coverage, as I've mentioned, seems to be uh, uh, fairly focused towards the life sciences. Uh, disciplines like the humanities and engineering seem to be slightly underrepresented. The geolocation, as you've seen as well, seems good uh, as long as you, as, as you look at the US coverage only. On a global scale, worldwide, uh, it's not quite representative. And the web identity coverage seems to be fairly poor, and as such, take an ORCID only as a registry to identify uh, web identities um, may not quite be uh, um, applicable, not, not yet there, basically. Right? Okay, step two. Uh, if once we have discovered our web identities, how do we discover the artifacts that uh, belong to those web identities? And there's basically uh, three approaches that we are contemplating. Uh, one is an uh, algorithmic approach, going back to Mark's uh, personal web page. We, will, we could find his uh, page listing all his presentations from there on. There are uh, slides linked to that. There are audio files, video files for his presentations um, linked to that. So that's an algorithmic approach by scraping uh, in a smart manner, potentially, automatically, those artifacts from the web page. So that's uh, one algorithmic approach. The second approach is uh, something that uh, SlideShare offers. It's a uh, notification mechanism, so you could register for SlideShare and you can ask the service to notify you whenever a researcher of interest has uh, uh, uploaded a new presentation, for example, and the service would notify you actively. That's the second approach. And the third one is, again, using uh, um, artifacts on those uh, um, uh, registries to... Um, um, using the artifact registry, I'm sorry, such as ORCID, for example, to, um, to, to get those artifacts. We'll see the um, uh, ORCID page of Mark uh, Margenzo again. Not only does he have a total of 12 works uh, listed in this profile, uh, five of those are actually artifacts of interest for our use case because there are you know, standards, documents, reports, book reviews, things that don't necessarily have a DOI, things that don't necessarily are uh, covered by uh, locks and clocks and the like. Okay, so these three approaches is what we're considering for the uh, discovery of artifacts. Once we have discovered the artifacts, how do we, as Herbert mentioned, how do we determine, determine the boundary of those? How do we know where the artifact of interest ends and where the cat video starts, kind of deal, right? So there are also uh, two approaches we're considering. I focus on the signposting approach with a uh, nice little logo, and signposting.org is the, uh, the website that I encourage you to go to. It is an approach to make the scholarly web more friendly to machines. How do we do this? We're proposing to do this with uh, uh, HTTP links and uh, registered link relation types. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, let me explain by an example. Imagine two URIs, two resources. Uh, resource one is identified by URI on, uh, one, and resource two is identified by URI two. If resource one, let's say, is a, is a, is a metadata record, uh, that describes, let's say, a scholarly article uh, identified with the URI2, you could link these two with the registered link relation types one describes two, right? <coughs> Makes sense. If you then send an HTTP uh, request to URI1, you would see in your, uh, in your HTTP response, you would get a link header that says, uh, your, uh, I describe URI2. So that's a fairly uh, uh, simple, easy to implement approach to convey relationships between these resources, uh, an approach that a machine can understand and interpret. So if you apply this paradigm to particular patterns, certain patterns that repeat in the world of scholarly communication, uh, we could come up with an example like this, where we're trying to uh, um, describe the boundary problem. So you imagine you, end, uh, uh, you, you browse to a landing page, and this landing page has several outgoing links to several different resources. How does a machine now know which resources are relevant to that particular landing page that you may have gotten to? Well, uh, it could communicate that by implementing links to the relevant resources. Uh, let's say the publication in its HTML uh, format, the publication in its PDF format, and some supplemental information that you can imagine. And it could do so by saying, all these resources are relevant to me, they belong to me, they are my items. Right? And the other way around, of course, works as well. Those uh, individual uh, uh, publication resources could link back to the landing page and say, I belong to that collection of that landing page. Right? So there's a, a bi-directional aspect to this as well. Uh, this, of course, is a fairly simple example. You can imagine much more complex examples. I won't go into detail here. Uh, but the notion of uh, a, a DOI representing, uh, I'm sorry, redirecting to a landing page and uh, the notion of 
uh, describing where my metadata records are that describe the thing that's identified by the DOI and uh, uh, the other way around as well. So um, signposting has been motivated by the use case of uh, uh, locks, trying to find the uh, relevant resources that are to be archived for machines. Um, and so it's somewhat motivated, inspired by the preservation of, e uh, of journals in, the, in, in that realm. However, there's no reason why this could not be applied to the scholarly portals that we talked about uh, previously. Right? So technically, there's absolutely no reason. The question, of course, arises, how do you motivate uh, these portals to, to adopt those, um, uh, those technologies? We see uh, early uptake, so the um, University College Dublin uh, Library has adopted uh, this, this sort of approach, uh, data site has adopted it, and so on and so forth. So uh, there's some, some early success there, which is encouraging. Right, so with this, I think I'll hand it over to Michael, who will uh, detail step four in our process. Thanks, Martin. All right. Let's see if we can use the clicker here. Didn't work for me. Didn't work. Okay, all right. No clicker. <laughs> All right, so some of the challenges for capturing these web artifacts, right? We really have sort of two main challenges. The first one is the legal challenge, what do we do with it? And the technical challenge, uh, how well do our tools work? Can we verify and scale how well these tool works? And can we verify the authenticity? We fully expect that we can address this second issue. <laughs> the, uh, the problem, of course, is with the first issue, as you might expect, it's a real mess. So when you look at some of the popular tools that people are using, we look at the robots.txt, and it's sort of a, 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 a mixed match of things. So for SlideShare and GitHub, they have a very complicated robots.txt. Some of these things can be preserved. Some of them can't. Drupal seems to do mostly the right thing. But on the other hand, in this case, they have the license telling you don't do archiving. Right? Obviously, we ignore that, but uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so probably don't listen to me. Um, this one, the Open Science Framework, doesn't want crawling, so I, it's not really clear what you can do with this content. All right, but assuming we put that aside, if we look at how some of these artifacts look in popular web archiving uh, tools. So right here we have a slide share presentation from Mark and how it looks on the live web. Then here it is in Web Recorder and here it is in the Internet Archive. And you quickly, you can't really tell the difference. So the idea here is in this example, all the tools do a pretty good job. Then we go to a GitHub, and I think uh, this is from Mark's GitHub. So here's the live version. Web Recorder does a pretty good job. You can't really tell the difference in here, but clearly something's going on with the Internet Archive. Turns out a style sheet that's missing and it rearranges all of the content. Then we go to the Open Science Foundation, and here's the live web version, and this is uh, Mark's identity here. And Web Recorder does a bad job, and the Internet Archive does a bad job, but they do different bad jobs, right? <laughs> so you have that going for you. Um, so we, you know, this is right now, we look at this and say, okay, these are all banged up. It didn't really do a good job. Now, we want to automate this so we don't have to look at it and say it's banged up. So one of the things we're doing in this project is continuing some research. We started with Justin Brunel, and it was first published at JCL a couple of years ago. And the idea is how can we quantifiably measure how well pages are archived at scale. And the idea is we don't just want to say, okay, we've got nine out of 10 embedded resources, so it's 90%, because not all the things that are missing are going to be of equal weight. So if you have a YouTube video and the video is missing, that's one resource and you got all the little GIFs and whatever, but clearly the main thing the human, from a human perception, yeah, it was not well archived. <clears throat> so we did some preliminary experience uh, we, we manually damaged some pages, we showed them to mechanical Turker uh, workers, and we had them uh, ranked from like most to least damage and so forth. And we came up with some heuristics to attach for when things are really missing. And of course, the problem is if things are really missing, you don't know how big they were, right? So you go back to 2005, you replay a memento, it's missing, missing something, but it's not clear what it was actually doing with the page. One of the unexpected results is style sheets from a user's perspective are actually super important. So from our perspective, we said, well, the content's all there. It's just rearranged funny, 
but it's there, you can deal with it. The user's perspective was, no, it's damaged, it looks ugly, I don't like it. Then we had two tracks, we decided we could try to educate all of the people in the world <laughs> about that. And then we decided, or we can adjust our weights and say, if you're missing a style sheet, it's kind of important. So we actually came up with this trick. And the idea here is we have this uh, the local uh, newspaper, uh, Norfolk newspaper. And this is the left-hand side of how it appears on the live web. And here's a memento where it's missing a style sheet. Now, again, all the text is there. But then if the style sheet is missing, we divide the page into thirds. And the idea is you have non-background colors more or less equally distributed across these, uh, these third columns. So here it is in the live web, 33%, 26%, 29%. That's normal page design. If it's missing, then we actually get scenarios like this, where everything gets shifted to the left because there's no style sheet moving things out to the right. And so basically, if you have more than 75% of your non-background colors and the left two-thirds and nothing over here, then we're considering that page damaged. Now, if you just have an ugly page and no style sheet is missing, then you have an ugly page and we don't penalize you for that. So that's one of the tricks that we do. Now, in Justin's work, what we ran into is we had a test library. Uh, it worked okay for if you knew exactly what you're doing. But we have a service that's nearly ready for prime time. We have some URLs here. Uh, maybe don't tweak them so much because uh, we're, still, we're still tweaking with it and so it's almost ready. But the idea is there's three ways to interact with this. One is there's an interactive service to make it friendly to, to plug things into. So you put the URL of a live web page or more interestingly a memento and it goes through and applies all the techniques that we've had and gives you a final score ranked from zero to one. Um, that works well for onesie twosie kinds of things, but there's Python library and a Docker image for you to download if you're going to run it for 100,000 mementos. All right. So what we're going to do is look at some of these examples right here. So the first thing that we have is a, a memento at the Internet Archive. This is of our departmental homepage, and you can't really see it, but there's a little teeny image that's missing there. And, you know, who cares, right? So the damage is very small. It's a 0 .06 and not a lot of damage. Now, what are the units on there? They're, they're mystical damage units. doesn't matter, right? It's for ranking mementos with each other. <coughs> In this case, we have some, I forget what the, web, uh, what the web page is. It's missing a single image as well. But this is large and it's centered in the viewport. That was probably more important. Maybe it was just a logo. We don't really know. But the damage increases more significantly because intuitively this image is more important to the presentation of that page. Then we look at the third example and we have all kinds of problems, right? Basically all these images are missing. They're big, they're important, and so we adjust the weight together. Now we still have, uh, adjusted upward. We still have all the text, but maybe those images were saying something important. All right. So when we apply this technique to Ian's GitHub memento, this is what it looked like on the live web. This is what it looks like in the Internet Archive. We plug it into the tool, and we actually get a small amount of damage, because I think it's just barely this gray bar and some of this stuff hanging out here. I think it's just barely missing that 75% in the two-thirds range. So in this case, it squeaks out with not a lot of damage, um, even though it's not exceptionally pretty. But on the other hand, the native GitHub, GitHub uh, interface is not exceptionally pretty either, so I don't know. All right, so that was about verifying the quality of archiving at scale. Again, almost ready for prime time. The next thing is about verifying the authenticity of what we have in the archive. Now, the issue is when there's only one archive, we implicitly trust Brewster and the Internet Archive that he, you know, unless he's running a really long con, we don't have to worry about him going in and hacking things. But as we move to an environment where there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of archives, we really have to worry about, you know, are you going to trust the Breitbart archive that pops up at some point, right? So just hypothetically, if you had a NASA.gov web page that talked about parts per million of carbon dioxide, and then 10 years, of course, this page will surely go away, right? And then at some point, you can't say this is labeled Michael's evil way back, 
So <laughs> I'm presenting this to you as a principled scholar, but I'm a gun for hire. I, I will work on the Breitbart Archive. I'm not proud. Um, so I'll go in and I'll edit this, and it says 275 parts per million. Don't worry, everything's fine. There's no such thing as climate change. But five years from now, the NASA.gov page itself is unavailable. How are you going to resolve who, who has what observation? Right? So um, again, fake archives are an issue that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Right? right now, we're at this luxury case where not many people are running archives. Eventually, there's going to be economic incentive to run archives, and then we're going to have a huge problem. All right. So our approach to that, and this is really early. We're just working out uh, proof of concept and so forth. In this case, we're taking a PDF to keep it really simple. So this is our original resource, and we're going to push copies of this into all the public archives that we can think of. Right. So right now, it's going to the Internet Archive, Archive Today, Web Citation. You could push it into Perma CC and all the other ones that are available. So. Then we come and we compute fixity information on this. Now, in the future, it would be nice if the Wayback Machine would compute fixity as it ingests things. But for the moment, we're essentially replaying it immediately and then observing the fixity information that comes back. And then we make a manifest of this information, which has the specific URI and how you replayed it so you could get back the original content and not the process content, and then the date of the observation a whole list of hash values that you got. And not shown in here is a list of how you computed those hashes, because there's a million ways that you can combine it. So now we have a manifest file. We put that on a server and publish that on the web. And then you feel what's coming next, right? So then we take this manifest file, and then we push that into all the different archives that exist. So now we have essentially a list of the fixity information pushed into in different public web archives. All right. So now we've got a bunch of copies of things making assertions about each other. We have the original resource. We have n number of mementos about those resources. We have a manifest that talks about, I observed that this memento at this time returned this fixity information. And then of that, we make lots of copies of that file as well. And the idea is hopefully some of these are going to survive in the long term. So how do we authenticate that? So the idea is you're going to come across a single memento, and either with a browser add-on, or you're going to use a Python library to do this at scale or whatever. Given a memento, we're going to have a well-known place where you can look up the manifest file for that memento. And then we're going to discover all the mementos in that manifest, and then verify the integrity of the manifest file itself using something called trusty URIs. You can read more about how we're doing that here. And then for that, we're going to go through and then recompute the fixity of that information to discover whether or not that page said what it says now, if it said that at some point in the past. Then if we can take a vote. And if you can believe that these are independent archives, and that's a whole separate thing, right? Because mementos are mem mementos, not necessarily the same thing as an independent archive. Then we just do a majority vote. And we have a video that we can tweet out uh, later that actually covers this scenario and finds that in Michael's evil archive that the NASA.gov page has been tampered with and the, uh, and the other mementos have not been tampered with. All right, so I think that's the end of our presentation. Uh, this is a point where we take your questions.